Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll just start with an opening statement. I want to thank you first for the opportunity to be here today and brief you on the recent incidents involving surface forces in the Western Pacific. The comprehensive review that examined the systemic issues surrounding these incidents and then review the corrective action. Before I begin, I must say that uh, throughout this investigative process, our first and last thoughts have been with our fallen sailors and their families. And I want to offer my deep condolences to those who lost a loved one and ensure them that they will always be part of the Navy family. A review of uh, your Navy today shows that this morning there are 100 ships and 64,000 sailors and Navy civilians forward deployed. This includes three carrier strike groups and their embarked air wings, three amphibious readiness groups and their embarked marine expeditionary units, six ballistic missile defense ships on station, 11 attack submarines, five SSBNs. The vast majority of, the, of these ships are conducting their missions, some of them extremely difficult, effectively and professionally, protecting America from attack, promoting our interests and prosperity, and advocating for the rules that govern the vast commons from the seafloor to space and in cyberspace. And we do much of this work with our allies and partners, enhancing our combined capacity co to contribute to maritime security and improve our lethality in warfighting at sea. In recent three-week period, for instance, we conducted over 19 exercises with our partners <coughs> involving 30 partner nations. This is what you expect of your Navy. This is why we exist. The Navy's been run hard in the past 16 years of war, and the pace is picking up, especially in the Pacific. And recent experience has shown that if we're not careful, we can become overstretched, overextended. And if we take our eye off the fundamentals, we become vulnerable to mistakes at all levels of command. In response to the series of incidents in the surface force in 2017, culminating in the collisions involving the USS Fitzgerald and the USS John S. McCain, the Navy conducted both independent investigations into the specific incidents to determine what happened on board, and also a comprehensive review to identify any systemic causal and contributing factors as to why these incidents occurred. Both of these efforts developed the actions needed to prevent them in future operations. I'll be clear, these accidents were preventable. The causes for the collisions included a failure to plan for safety, a failure to adhere to sound navigational practices, a failure to execute basic watch standing principles, a failure to properly use available navigation tools, failure to respond deliberately and effectively when in extremis of collision, a loss of situational awareness and high traffic density, failure to follow the international rules of the road, and for John S. McCain, insufficient knowledge and proficiency of the ship's steering system. We are a Navy that learns from our mistakes. U.S. Fleet Forces Commander Admiral Phil Davidson recently concluded a comprehensive review which was informed further by other mishaps going back 10 years. The comprehensive review team was made up of 34 uniformed and civilian personnel, and their backgrounds range from specialists in navigation to officers and civilians with extensive experience in afloat leadership, underway operations, institutional training, equipment and systems research, development, acquisition, and ship maintenance. <clears throat> it also included civilian experts and military members from other Navy warfare communities and from other services. Multiple members also had substantial experience in conducting investigations and audits. Several distinguished individuals, a four-star retired general and flag officers from the Army, the Marine Corps, a naval aviator and a Navy, naval submariner, as well as the president of the Maryland Pilot, Harbor Pilots Association and an academic from MIT were on the team to advise Admiral Davidson. And the comprehensive review found that over a sustained period of time, rising pressure to meet operational demands led those in command to rationalize declining standards, standards in fundamental seamanship and watch standing skills, teamwork, operational safety, assessment, and the professional culture. 
This resulted in a reduction of operational safety margins. Further, the demand for ready and certified ships to support operations exceeded the quantity that could be supplied, lacking an effective process to clearly define available supply and associated readiness, steadily increasing risks were not understood or appropriately mitigated as these ships were routinely assigned to high priority short notice tasking. This practice became the norm and resulted in situations where individuals and teams could no longer recognize that the processes in place to identify, communicate, and assess readiness and risk were no longer working on ships or at headquarters. To address this, we have taken some immediate actions. And these actions include restoring a deliberative scheduling process in the Seventh Fleet, conducting comprehensive ready for sea assessments for all Japan based ships, establishing the Naval Surface group in the Western Pacific, an independent body in Yokosuka, Japan, that will keep their eye on readiness generation and standards for the uh, Pacific Fleet Commander. Establishing and using a near-miss program to understand and disseminate lessons learned. And establishing policies for surface ships to routinely actively transmit on their automatic identification system, a system that lets other ships in the area know uh, that what they're doing. We have other ongoing immediate actions focused on upgrading the training of navigation fundamentals, assessing operational demands against available resources, grading the baseline readiness of all Seventh Fleet cruisers and destroyers, optimizing the authority and accountability for readiness, implementing schedules that ensure everybody gets sufficient rest, and baselining the force generation model for the Japan-based ships. We also have some midterm uh, actions that are focused on developing the process to generate sustainable ready forces, starting with the Japan-based ships, reviewing the qualification standards, establishing comprehensive policies on managing fatigue, revising readiness assessment standards, aligning the operational requirements to available resources, and accelerating the, uh, uh, some of the electronic navigation system upgrades. And we have additional longer-term actions. So there's immediate actions, short-term, and then uh, mid-term, and then long-term. Long-term actions include improving individual and team training skills with an emphasis on basic seamanship, navigation, and integrated bridge equipment evaluating core officer and enlisted curricula with an emphasis on fundamentals, navigation skills. I, I got to say, though, that fundamental to all of this is how we prepare leaders for command. And we will deeply examine the way that we prepare officers for increasing leadership challenges, culminating in assumption of command with the capability and the confidence to form, train, and assess warfighting teams on the bridge, in the Combat Information Center, in engineering, and throughout their command. Our Navy, from the most junior sailor to the most senior commander, must value achieving and maintaining high operational and warfighting standards of performance. And these standards must be embedded in our equipment, our individuals, our teams, and our fleets. And the Navy is absolutely committed to doing everything possible to prevent a tragic loss like this again. We should never allow an accident like this to take the lives of such magnificent young sailors and inflict such painful grief on their families, the Navy, and the nation. We must get this right, and we will. We own this, and we're moving out. Thank you for your time again, and I look forward to your questions. Admiral, um, obviously this review is about the Seventh Fleet, but as you look across the Navy and its ships as a whole, don't some of these problems also exist perhaps in other AORs? And what are you doing to look at some of those and how do you replicate some of this across the other ships in your fleet? Or is this just Seventh Fleet and do you need more ships there? 
So to, to uh, start, to get started, we had to contain the uh, investigation, the scope of the investigation. And so we did concentrate on where we were seeing the problems, which is the uh, cruiser and destroyers out in the Seventh Fleet. That's where we started, both with the uh, incident investigations, obviously, and also with the comprehensive review. Now that we have that investigation complete, you know, it's my intention. In fact, I just transmitted a message to all commanding officers, similar audience that I transmitted the operational pause message, for them to study this at all levels of command to figure out and, and, and determine, you know, where are they might be vulnerable to the findings in the comprehensive review and also to take a look at what of the recommended actions might apply to them. And I've asked them to put together a report, report to their uh, superiors, and I'll see the, the consolidated uh, results of that effort. But do you okay. think it's likely that this some of these problems exist? I will tell you, areas? we have the ultimate uh, test for uh, our effectiveness is combat operations, and uh, as I pointed out, you know we have a four deployed fleet, and over this year in the not too distant past, and currently right now, we they are performing exquisitely in the highest uh, degree of combat, and so we're going to go out with the sense that we want to look at everybody and find uh, vulnerabilities and plug them where they exist. Barbara? Well, you say uh, that you and the Navy own the problem, and we understand, uh, with all due respect you, sir, at the pleasure of the President, you've described a series of ongoing, very comprehensive problems that underlie all of this. So the question is, um, why you, as CNO, why didn't you know about any of these problems? Because if you knew, you certainly would have fixed them. So how is it that you didn't know? And as Chief of Naval Operations, what response, while you serve at the pleasure, what responsibility as CNO do you bear on this with all due respect? Do you believe that you still have the confidence of the sailors and of Navy families? Should you remain as CNO? Barbara, I think that uh, there's no doubt, and I made clear from the very beginning, that uh, as the CNO, I own this, and I, I won't dodge from that ownership. Uh, as we've studied uh, similar catastrophes, incidents in the past, both in the Navy and outside the Navy, there is this slow uh, degradation that happens. Uh, and uh, what you end up is a uh, process where it's you, you become a, a, a situation where deviancy becomes normalized. If you can't meet the, uh, or you don't meet the standard, the absolute standards, you come up with a system of standards that you do meet. So we're aware of this. I do own it. We're taking firm corrective action, and we'll get this right. All due respect, uh -huh. I understand that, Admiral. The question really professionally is, what responsibility is there in the CN with, this, with a chief of naval operations for not knowing about all of these problems that led to the loss of so many lives. Well, and again, you know, there. I'm asking you how you feel about it. I feel responsible for this. And do you think you can remain with the confidence of the fleet, of the sailors? I do. Admiral, thanks for your, your time on this. You mentioned sleep deprivation. You mentioned managing fatigue. Could you give a sense if sleep deprivation had anything to do in the two accidents? And then what are the Navy recommendations for sleep? Is it four hours? Is it five hours? Yeah, so the, uh, the fatigue did play a role in, uh, in these incidents. And uh, we've recently gone to a, uh, throughout the Navy now, the Surface Force recently made it mandatory to execute uh, their uh, at-sea schedule with respect, uh, paying respect to what we call a, a circadian rhythm, a 24-hour cycle. Inside that cycle, getting six to eight hours within a 24-hour period. So that's not mandatory. Six that's to eight mandatory. Hours right. You should be getting that that type of uh, sleep every 24-hour cycle. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Hi, um, Sam Legrand with USNI News. Uh, just a, when you look, read the comprehensive review, you see that there's um, institution of new organizations and institution of additional oversight. Um, what what didn't wasn't readily apparent uh, when you read it was how do you say no to a combatant commander? Uh, Bob Work, uh, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, said earlier this week that the problem, particularly with the Navy, is a simple one. It's there are not enough ships to do the missions that are out there. So in 1999, there were 330-ish 
with 100 ships deployed. Now there's 276 with about 100 ships deployed. How do you tell those combatant commanders? And what responsibility do you all have to say no to them? And how do you do that? Yeah, this is the, uh, the uh, responsibility and accountability that comes with command. It's, it's fundamental in the nature of command that uh, you, if you're not ready to execute the mission that you're assigned, you've got to make that clear. And we have a number of examples, again, where that happens at every level of command. Admiral Davidson and I have those uh, conversations. Admiral Swift and I have those conversations. And uh, you know, that happens all the way down uh, to unit level commanders. Uh, when we fail to do that, uh, we've got to, uh, it, we, we, we become vulnerable. We get uh, assigned for missions for which we're not prepared. So we have to ensure that uh, we, we create a climate. This is this uh, idea of culture that's uh, discussed in the comprehensive review that uh, values these discussions uh, and is, is open and listening to those commanders who are saying that I've been stretched too thin. Yeah. You sort of talked about the culture. I mean, you can improve training, you can institute sort of sleep, sleep cycles. But obviously, none of this would have been possible if there wasn't a culture of uh, sort of ignoring some of the things that happen. How do you build a culture where people will start listening? And, and sort of, it takes decades for that to build out. How, how do you build yeah. that? Yeah, no, I disagree that it takes decades. And there are a number of examples where large organizations with forceful action can really get at this and turn uh, very much more quickly than that. And so, this is what it's going to take. Uh, you know, a, a forceful. Uh, effort by every level of command in the Navy. That's what we hope to catalyze through this comprehensive review and keeping our leaders in this discussion from the four-star level all the way down. Thank you. Um, to get back to the culture question, you said that you know the high pace of operations led to a culture of accepting a lowered rate of readiness and lowered standards. Were you part of that culture? Um, did it get to a point where you felt pressure that you couldn't say no to something and you needed to resource? I never felt those pressures. So but, it's, yeah. but were you part of that culture, sir? Well, I, I'm the chief of naval operations, and so uh, it, you know, just to Barbara's point, it's hard to escape uh, that level of responsibility. We're all, everybody in the Navy is part of this, uh, including leadership. Now, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about training or a lack of training. It used to be in years past that an ensign would leave the service academy or ROTC, go up to Newport for surface warfare school, spend months, if not more than a year up there, learning how to drive a ship, going out on patrol craft, a lot of classroom time. In 2003, after decades, they changed that. They gave 21 CDs. Right. They sent some of these ensigns out to ships and basically said, you'll learn how to do it on the job. That lasted for seven years. Admiral John Harvey, who ran the Atlantic Fleet, went to the Hill in 2010 and said this was a mistake. This didn't work. Right. So first of all, talk about the lack of training. And do you have dozens, if not scores, of officers out there that simply don't know how to drive a ship because of that lack of training? And you talk about uh, overextended, overstretched. You talk about sleep deprivation. You talk about rising pressure. But the report says that the commanding officer of one of these ships didn't know how to operate a console when there was a steering mishap. Now, he didn't know how to drive his ship. So what does that have to do with the sleep deprivation or being overstretched or rising pressure? This officer couldn't drive his ship. How do you explain that? No, you're exactly right. These are failures of, of command. <clears throat> and uh, when you talk about training, uh, just to your point, we've moved away from that system where we had uh, a, a set of CDs and, and we did all that training on the job. We've reinstituted the uh, basic division officer courses. We've reinstituted an advanced division officer course and have been making steady improvements to both the officer and enlisted training uh, throughout. We've got more work to do here. The comprehensive review uh, identifies several areas where we can do that. Then these ready for sea assessments are going around and doing that assess, uh, that look, that grading to ensure that uh, we get a, a solid uh, look and an understanding of what the proficiency is at sea. And again, there are many, many examples of where our uh, ships, their commanding officers, their crews are doing very well. But if it's not monitored on a continuous basis, these skills can atrophy very quickly. My question is, if, if I could, yeah. my question is, during that seven-year period where you had lax training, where you gave these people CDs, are you worried that there are too many officers out there in the fleet 
that simply don't know how to drive a ship. We're doing these ready for sea assessments to but determine that exactly. That I'm concerned enough that I support these ready for sea assessments. We're going to get a solid baseline of that readiness and uh, proficiency. Admiral, what are the biggest mistakes your sailors made that led to these collisions? These were fundamental mistakes of uh, ship driving. And so the uh, basic uh, responsibility to maintain situational awareness of the ships around you, to know the basics of the rules, of the nautical rules of the road, how to respond when you get into a crossing situation, uh, the basics of understanding the ship control console. It was actually the operator who didn't uh, know how to do it, not the commanding officer. Uh, those, those are some pretty fundamental things. Do officers today have more training than the officers of 15 years ago aboard these ships? Uh, in, in some areas, yes. So the, the, they certainly have more training than they got when it was uh, a, a box of uh, compact discs and on-the-job training. So we have been reinstituting that training steadily. And in the comprehensive review, there is an appendix that lists exactly that journey that we've been on in training. Admiral, today, compared to 15 years ago, are you convinced that your officers aboard these ships have more training than 15 years ago? Yeah, it's more than just about hours, right? Uh, it's a, it's about the quality of the training and uh, to, you know overall, right? It's just that the hours is is a false metric, and so uh, this is exactly what the comprehensive review looked at. It identified some areas we can beef that up, and we're moving out to do that. Patrick Tucker, uh, uh, Patrick Tucker from Defense One. All the failures that you just described are very human failures. As you know, um, <coughs> Spawar is now looking at a, uh, they're testing a unmanned ship that actually can follow rules of the road and has demonstrated great uh, sort of safety potential. Did the committee that looked at this make any recommendations in terms of next generation software, autonomy, things like that to reduce the cognitive load that's being placed on these human crewmen? Right, we've done a lot of examination of that uh, sort of Navy-wide already outside the scope of a comprehensive review. And so we'll continue that effort uh, independent of the comprehensive review. It's actually, uh, you know, it, it's, it's making progress and we're monitoring that closely. Okay. Yeah, look at that in the context of this. You can look at that in the context. No, of we're studying that outside the context of the review, sir. Well, you, you, you've used the word failure uh, many times, uh, but you haven't used the word negligence. Was there negligence involved in either of these accidents? Yes. Well, by uh, several people. I mean, we found that the commanding officers were at fault. Uh, the executive officers were at fault. There are some watchstanders on the uh, ships, and we've We've been uh, pretty clear about, you know, identifying uh, where there was fault and taking appropriate accountability actions up to and including the uh, Seventh Fleet Commander. And do you anticipate legal action against uh, some of those uh, guilty of negligence? I've assigned Admiral Frank Caldwell to be a consolidated disposition authority to take a look, comprehensive look at uh, all of these and to uh, make his recommendations with respect to any further action we may do. Admiral, you said that you know, the vast majority of ships are operating safely and effectively. I mean, some of the findings here are, are pretty stunning. I mean, for example, the, the training continuum of surface warfare officers and candidates, quartermasters and operations specialists, my humble rate, uh, does not su provide sufficient seamanship and navigational knowledge in advance of milestone assignments. So, I mean, I guess the question is, how could you possibly know if the system out there is, or if the ships out there are operating training, uh, you know, safely and effectively, especially since there doesn't seem to be, and the review finds, a good uh, way of measuring the performance as these people go along in their careers. No, you're right. A, a big uh, conclusion of the comprehensive review is that we've got to uh, beef up the assessment process uh, across the board, both in individual and in team uh, training and effectiveness. Uh, but uh, and in many uh, cases, that assessment is going on right now. And so while we did focus on this area in the Seventh Fleet, uh, there's assessments of uh, readiness going on uh, throughout the Navy, uh, which give us a sense of uh, that proficiency and that effectiveness. Admiral, I'm Just in reading through this and listening to you, it sounds like that it, the way this was going, these were accidents that were almost kind of destined to happen to some ship or ships out there. Would you say that's a fair statement, that this was an accident waiting to happen? It's been going all along? I would, ref I would rephrase uh, that. I would say that uh, what happened was a gradual erosion of the margin to safety. And so when uh, the system has that and you get this uh, reduced margin to safety, you combine that with the stressful situation, 
then uh, you're, like much, you're much you're much more that. vulnerable. You, you're much more vulnerable to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, um, you've described um, a number of changes that are being put forth, but as you know, a, uh, a few years ago in the Bilal report, a lot of the same recommendations were put forth. There were also some of the same forms of recommendation that you've made now. Why is this iteration of um, problems that uh, were first brought up years ago and going to be addressed this time? Why should people, the American public and the Navy community have confidence that in this um, iteration there, these problems are actually going to be addressed? And then the report goes on to describe a real fundamental problem in training, in leadership, in culture, and even the quality of the ships. It talks about how they're some of the oldest ships in the fleet. In an AOR where the U.S. is dealing with a very um, real threat vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, given that you've got a seventh fleet that hasn't mastered the fundamentals, what confidence should the American public have that seventh fleet can handle what is probably one of the highest risks from the U.S. national security yeah. perspective? That, I'll tell you, these ships in the 7th Fleet did not master the fundamentals, and we noticed some uh, issues at headquarters that uh, may have set them up for that. We're correcting that very quickly, but again, you know, there are ships in the 7th Fleet that are out there doing their job. Uh, their ships are old by you know, since they've been built, but they are also been uh, some of the most modernized ships as well, and so we can, you know, have been consistently sending our most advanced capability out to the 7th Fleet. Right, to the Bilal report, please. Yes, Admiral, thank you. Uh, Dan Lamont, Washington Post. I wanted to ask you about transparency through all this. Uh, your report that you released yesterday kind of mentioned you trying to balance the legal concerns for the country along with uh, trying to get information out about the McCain incident and the Fitzgerald incident. Right. At the same time, the Navy is still withholding all documents requested through FOIA on the Lake Champlain collision. Can you explain that dichotomy and what will be happening there? I'll, I'll take a look into the uh, request on the Lake Champlain uh, incident. I wasn't familiar that that uh, has been held up. Uh, there are legal concerns that uh, have to be uh, recognized and, and uh, addressed, uh, but it has been a pretty consistent uh, thrust through this effort, including the release of the full comprehensive review, uh, release of the uh, descriptions of the uh, Fitzgerald and McCain incidents to maintain that level of transparency. So I'll check on the uh, what we can release on the uh, Lake Champlain. To a similar level of transparency with these other incidents? Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I will do that. The Lake Champlain will come up with you know a similar uh, description of that incident that uh, we put together for uh, Fitzgerald and McCain. Okay? All right. Um, Carla Bad Voice of America, I just want to kind of follow up on Champlain. Um, there are people that said more should have been done after the Champlain incident, after the Antietam incident in January that might could have prevented these two deadly incidents that occurred after. Why wasn't more done? Why wasn't an investigation or a more thorough investigation put in place before these happened? Yeah, there were uh, thorough investigations done of those two incidents. You just referred to them. And uh, you know, th those uh, incidents were shared on a more local level. This uh, effort to instill this near miss and lessons learned program will improve our ability to get those lessons out more broadly, more quickly, so we can prevent this in the future. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Admiral. Um, James from Aviation Week. The nation has spent billions of dollars on these, on these ships uh, to take out ballistic missiles and, uh, you know, over the past couple of years have intercepted no North Korean uh, missiles during all that testing. Uh, why haven't they done so? And with what the fleet that you've got out there at the moment, could you do that if required by the President? Uh, you know, uh, the details of that uh, capability are classified, as are the decisions that go into uh, – so it's just inappropriate to discuss those sorts of things here. Um, yeah. Why wasn't the Lake Champlain CO uh, relieved? Antietam, you know, runs aground in Tokyo Bay. That CO is relieved. Fitzgerald CO triad is relieved. McCain triad relieved. You guys won't not only release that report, but this guy uh, changed command last month and you guys put out, you know, the Navy news press release. Yeah, each one of those cases is evaluated independently, uh, consistent with this uh, commitment. I'll, I'll get to that answer as well. Yeah. Um, the report said that the um, Japanese-based uh, ships were, were uh, adequately resourced with the exception of Manning. And as much of this uh, comprehensive review says that the issues were inherent in Pack Fleet um, and, and Seventh Fleet, how much of that Responsibility for Manning, however, is a U.S.-based function, either from you know from from y'all's office in OPNAV or Fleet Forces. That that Manning component 
that uh, you indicated in the comprehensive review that was under resourced. How much of that is a pack fleet? Seventh Fleet responsibility, how much of that is a U.S.-based responsibility? I think that there's responsibility uh, for everybody in that regard um, in terms of how that manning is, you know, assigned and then allocated. Uh, we realized this on our own you know, before the uh, incidents happened. And, you know, the manning fluctuates uh, throughout the fleet, and there's always an effort to make sure that we are ensuring that first and foremost are uh, at sea and our deployed forces amongst them are uh, manned with the highest priority that we're filling those at sea gaps we made some adjustments recently to uh you know, readdress what has uh, been a slight degradation in landing levels out in the pacific we're already starting to see the return on those but that was put in place uh you know before these happen so it's you know it's a constant balancing and optimization effort that we strive to uh, achieve yeah Lee Hudson, Inside Defense. Uh, could you give us an update on the initial uh, cost estimate for repair? SECNAV said in September it was going to be about $600 million. That's what you were asking Congress for. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, and the uh, John S. McCain is still on their way to uh, Yokosuka, and we'll get a better estimate when she gets there. Well, can I follow up on something you said about the commanding officer? You said he was aware how to operate the ship control system, but the report says... No, I didn't say that. I, 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 go ahead. Okay. Well, the report says no one on watch on the McCain, including the commanding officer, was properly trained on how to correctly operate the ship control console. Right. right. I just want to make clear it was the operator there that uh, mis misoperated that. The commanding officer, it wasn't any help in that regard, so... But, right, yeah. but including the commanding officer, it says, did not know how to correctly operate the ship control console. Is that good enough? That is not good enough. But again, that gets yeah. back to lack of knowledge, lack of training, doesn't it? Not you're over, you're, you're not getting enough sleep, or you're stretched no, or that, extended. Yeah. That gets to the basic that knowledge gets, of how to drive a ship, doesn't it? That gets to the yeah exactly the training and qualification standards that were resident on that ship were were not right. Admiral. Yeah. Regarding the McCain investigation, it said that uh, I believe three of the officers on the bridge were from another ship were not uh, appropriately equipped and trained to operate. Uh, right. This goes to the uh, question about the ship control console. And so what had happened there? What, I was what, wondering, first of all, what how that happened yeah. and if that happens on other ships, if this is a, a systemic problem. Right. So the uh, what, what had happened specifically is that the operators, a couple of the operators on the bridge at the time of the uh, collision, particularly the, the uh, helm, uh, were actually crew members from Antietam who were temporarily assigned to the uh, John S. McCain. Now, when that happens, what, uh, when you get a, a watch stand, and this is not unusual, right? Ships in maintenance will, uh, it's not uncommon for them to, if they need to get their sailors at sea experience or qualifications and training, they'll assign their sailors to a, a ship that's going to sea and get some underway time. Uh, when that happens, though, the requisite qual training and qualification for the systems that are on that receiving command have got to be in place to ensure that uh, before they operate the equipment, they're trained, qualified, and certified uh, to, to do so. Accounting for any differences in equipment uh, configurations between the two commands, uh, specifically. And uh, that was a gap uh, on uh, John S. McCain. They did not go uh, to any kind of rigorous steps to ensure that those watch standards from Antietam were qualified on the equipment in the John S. McCain, and that ended up contributing to the confusion uh, that led to the collision. Is that gun decking, Admiral? Uh, I'll just say that uh, there was no rigor to the requalification standard. Admiral, for the culture issues we talked about before, um, you know, you're, you're an 05, 06 mid level officer. You know, are you really going to tell your ISIC that your ship is not good to go when that could realistically lead to a blemish on your fit rep and affect your career? It shouldn't and lead to, to that. When, excuse, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. tied to that, when you were at the 0506 level, whatever command you were at, did you ever tell your immediate ISIC that, you know, your uh, boat or unit was not good to go? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, like the, 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 the alternative is to go to, to sea unprepared or unsafe. All right, so you've got like to do seven. that, and uh, what's that? You know, where you're in the high stakes waters of seventh. Well, I was in know, those like, high stake waters. Yeah. All right, so this is the this culture issue, where you've you know the can do aspect of our navy is something that we want to preserve. It's this bottom up, uh, effusive uh, enthusiasm to get things done. People assign you know 
going and getting tasks done, uh, it, it, this is a positive in our Navy. When that turns around, it becomes the sense of sort of a must do. I've got to go out at any cost. This is when it becomes uh, toxic. And this is the culture adjustment that we have to make uh, where appropriate. We have to make it okay. We have to set the standards for uh, going out and executing your missions. And the commanding officers have to be absolutely blunt about whether they are meeting those standards or not. And if, you know, for instance, a material failure or uh, some kind of a training, uh, mistraining opportunity, you know, some adjustments have been made. And as I said, those conversations do happen. Uh, these, these are not things that never happen. It just wasn't happening regularly in the Seventh Fleet. Are the cultures different between a submarine and a surface ship? There are, I would say, uh, tribal uh, differences you know, in, in our war fighting areas, submariners, aviation, the special warfare, information warfare. You get the slightly different cultures uh, for each of those different uh, warfare specialties. And those things are, uh, are healthy things. They contribute to you know, overall naval power. When, though, they, they start to, those differences lead to, uh, I would say, uh, you know, Lack standards. This, there's, that's completely inappropriate. Is there Just a difference up between here. a submariner and a surface warfare officer, as, a, as it goes to navigation. No. So just to follow up on that point, if you're if you're in the aviation and you're out of compliance with NATOPS procedures, you can say I'm out of compliance in NATOPS procedures. If you're on a submarine and you're out of compliance with submap or or whatever other operational conditions that you have, right. you can say I'm out of compliance in this rule book. Right. We enable that conversation to happen. Where is that equivalency in the surface fleet? So there is some of that in the surface fleet, and part of the uh, res uh, recommendations in the comprehensive review are to reinforce that. So part of the review does talk about circadian rhythms and sleep, and what I'm wondering is, uh, are you looking to in uh, integrate the same kind of crew rest policies that the aviation community has into the surface warfare community? No, uh, the fundamentals of it, the principles of it, yes. Uh, you know, how they specifically execute it, uh, each of the missions will give rise to you know differences in execution. But the fundamentals of making sure that you know before you go and you operate on watch or you operate equipment, you're sufficiently rested. Those will be in stone. Okay. More ships. What's that? Admiral, do you need more ships in the Seventh Fleet? Does this suggest to you that perhaps undermanned, but also maybe you need additional various types of ships? Absolutely. Then? A part of this uh, highlighted that there's a mismatch between the sustainable level of naval power that we can generate with the current assigned forces in the Seventh Fleet and the mission set, the growing mission set that is uh, emerging out there. And so, you know, when, if we are going to define that sustainable level of uh, force generation at appropriate training and, and readiness standards, and there's a gap between that level of forces and what is, the missions that are out there, that gap can really only be met by uh, additional naval forces, okay. more ships. We'll see what that, uh, I mean, it, it's a dynamic number, right? Because the missions keep changing. Uh, what we are, uh, developing right now is, hey, with the currently assigned force, given maintenance and training and certification requirements, what is that sustainable level of force generation? Can I follow okay. up on that? Because the other alternative is to say no, to Sam's point, that if the ships aren't there, the way to fill the gap is not just more ships, but to say no, that there's only so much we can do. And no, you were talking right. earlier about how you had said no in, in your career. Why are we, are we not hearing about um, an announcement of some sort about reducing the demand, given that you have such problems on a fundamental level and you're trying to encourage a culture of saying, the we're demand, not ready? The demand is defined by the security environment, right? And uh, our ability to respond to that demand is defined by, throughout the Joint Force, not just the Navy, you know, the, uh, the uh, quantity of ready forces to meet that that uh, the demand of the security environment. When you have a gap between those two, that's risk, right? And so uh, it, it, it's all part of that, it's, you know, day-to-day -day assessment. Every commander has to wake up each day at their command level and say, hey, what has changed in my security environment? How is, what is my new risk posture? And how am I going to accommodate or mitigate that risk? And at some point, it may get to the point where I can't. And at that point, you've got to, you know, say no. Okay. Last question. At the beginning of the briefing, at the beginning of the briefing, you were mentioning about the size of the U.S. Navy and just the number of ships in general. But are these two incidents any kind of proof or indication that the U.S. fleet may have become too large to effectively manage or supervise? No. 
No, we've got uh, command structures in place that allow, you know, that to uh, proper oversight uh, and command to exist. Uh, so it's not a question of being uh, too large to command. Okay. No Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you.